Hello, about me. My name is Greg. I'm the uh, lab instructor and director for Two Groups, located in Sterling Heights, Michigan. Uh, just a quick show of hands. How many are familiar with tissue culture? How many have tried tissue culture? <coughs> All right, so the agenda, agenda for today, we're going to go over what tissue culture is, uh, the market demand for tissue culture, uh, why we use it, the viroid, viroids, viruses, and diseases that inflict the plants. We're going to go over some vectors. We're going to go over the TC workflow, the equipment we use, uh, the factors that affect culture growth and morphology, uh, nodal culture versus meristematic culture. We're going to go into different issues that we may find in culture. There's quite a few of them. Uh, then we've got a class discount at the end, uh, what you'll learn in class. Then we also have a Q&A at the end. If you got any questions that you know kind of pertain to what we're talking about first slide, go ahead and raise them up. Um, if not, go ahead and jot them down. We'll get to you at the end. So plant tissue culture, it's a collection of techniques used to maintain or grow plant cells, uh, tissues and organs under sterile conditions on a nutrient medium, medium of known composition. It's widely used to produce clones of a plant in a method known as micropropagation or clean cloning. So tissue culture is in its infancy right now. It's been around for about 50, 60 years. It might seem like a while, but when you think about how long human beings have been growing things, it's a blink of an eye. Uh, the global plant tissue culture market size was valued at 382 million in 2020. It's estimated to reach 895 million by 2030. It's got a compound annual growth rate of 8.5%, which is pretty significant. Uh, compared to or in the time span between 2021 to 2030. And this doesn't just apply to cannabis. Um, there's a lot of plants that are able to be tissue cultured. Um, so we're talking the wood producing varieties of, and fruits, uh, vegetables, ornamental, aquatic plants, they're all in high demand. So why do we tissue culture things? Uh, we do it for exponential propagation in a very small area compared to traditional cloning. Do it for virus and viroid remediation, which is really the main reason why a lot of cannabis gardeners are interested in this. Uh, disease remediation. Uh, so all the viruses, viroids, and diseases, um, it's been around in big ag, and so cannabis is no different. It's not immune to these issues. Do it for pest eradication and reinvigorate old plants. So mother plants, Keep them around for about 12 months they start to decline in their vigor so you're losing um, just the general overall strength of the plant potency uh, terpene uh, content um, obviously everything that us as gardeners are trying to obtain from the plant we're working in sterile conditions with tissue culture so this is a really good way to curve uh, any sort of these issues that might be present and uh, bring those down to as low as we can use it for genetic banking um, so a lot of you breeders out there, this might interest you a lot. Um, you don't have to keep you know, a room full of 40, 50 plants uh, just to keep them going. You can put them in culture vessels like this and without doing like any sort of synthetic seed protocols, just keep them in nodal culture and continue to subculture them out. Uh, we do it for embryo rescues. So if you've got a handful of old seeds, uh, might have not been stored in the best conditions, uh, hot, cold conditions that will really affect uh, the viability of a seed. Uh, the oldest seed that I brought back was about 20 years old. So it's really able to um, just breathe new life in that seed and give it the best possibility for survival. So mass propagation, uh, tissue culture clones are able to be replicated exponentially. So when you get from one node to two nodes, two to four, four to 16, this is where it gets crazy, 16 to 256, then 256 to some godly number. So as far as traditional cloning goes, in the beginning, it might you know, outpace TC cloning, but very quickly can rapidly surpass traditional cloning. Uh, you get uniform growth with tissue culture, uh, you get true type genetics, and you get hundreds and thousands of clones per you know, standard rack, depending on what size of rack that you're using. 
So for the virus, viroid, and disease and pest remediation, some of the viruses we're gonna go over are tobacco mosaic or TMV, alfalfa mosaic or AMV, Arabis, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, ARMV, cannabis cryptic, CCV. Uh, the main viroid we're gonna to touch on today is the hop latent viroid. It seems to be one that's very present in a lot of, uh, a lot of grows right now. Some of the diseases are leaf spot, mildews, your root rot. Some of the pests are fungus gnats, your thrips, aphids, white flies, and spider mites. And the general rule for tissue culture is if it's any sort of internal issue, uh, Meristematics is really the best way to go for that, uh, just because these issues are in the vascular system of the plant. And if it's any external issue, so um, any sort of pest, fungus, gnats, thrips, aphids, um, noticulture will clean that up. Some of the common viruses we go over, you got the tobacco mosaic virus. Symptoms on a plant can vary, but in general, plants show an overall lighter color along with mosaic patterns. You see this hook a lot. Um, that can, there's a lot of things that can cause issues, but I mean, pH drift can cause that. So if you, if you see issues like this in your garden, don't automatically go to, oh man, I got, I got a virus, I got a disease, I got something going on. Uh, you really wanna go back through um, your practices and see, well, could something be off? Uh, so plants can show a stunted growth, you get the leaf curling or hooking and necrosis. Flowers may be malformed and show low trichome quantity and quality. So again, this is very similar to what HPLD <coughs> can show. So really the test, testing out your plants is the best way to ensure what you're coming up against. That alfalfa mosaic virus or AMV, symptoms of this, include bright yellow mosaic or calico patterns on leaves. Older leaves develop a yellow mottled look with enlarged veins. AMV has been shown to infect 430 different plant species and it's tr transmitted mainly by a lot of aphids. Uh, seed transmission can also be a factor um, as well when it comes to transmission. So if you have a plant, breeders again, if you have a plant that's infected with something and you start to breed, then you may possibly be carrying these viruses over to the offspring. We got Arabis mosaic virus, or ARMV. It's a viral plant pathogen that is known to infect multiple hosts. It causes yellowing and dwarfing of raspberry and is one of the causes of mosaic of rhubarb. Can spread to cannabis and it closely remembers, resembles a manganese <coughs> deficiency. We got cannabis cryptic, or CCV. It's a double-stranded RNA virus, which is a little unique to this RNA virus because a lot of RNA viruses are usually single-stranded. Uh, symptoms can include mosaic patterns on foliage, similar to AMV. You'll get mottled or a puckered leaf look, and are possible are also possible symptoms, um, especially in the presence of other viral afflictions. Hoplate and viroid, this is the hot one right now. Uh, viroids are smaller in sizes than virus, uh, meaning they do not require mechanical damage uh, from poor pruning or poor training practices or pests that be transmitted. So if you have it on your hands and you go and you start touching your foliage, your leaves, or even your branches, it can be uh, absorbed into the plant that way. Um, HLVD can live on surfaces for up to two hours, so which is nice, it's not just omnipresent in the room. Uh, alcohol does not kill this viroid, only bleach does. So if you're in your garden and you have um, like a thing of rubbing alcohol and you're using that to disinfect, that might not be killing off this viroid. Marisomatic culture is the best solution for remediation for this one. So it's just a little look of what an infected plant to a healthy plant looks like. This is same strain, same growing conditions. The one on the left is infected. Now from a common eye, it may just look like poor, poor genetics. But on the right hand side, once it goes through that meristematic cleanup, you can see very quickly um, just the differences that it makes on genetics. So when they're in their vegetative state, 
you can see what an infected plant looks like next to a healthy plant. Uh, an infected plant, you know, from you know, maybe a common eye, you're like, oh man, I got all these branches, gonna have to be so as man, that's awesome. But then you get into the next pic or the picture before, and you're kind of uh, you're kind of let down a little bit. Now on this healthy side, uh, you get that proper branching, and you get more of a uh, traditional uh, cannabis growth structure. So you have strong apical dominance, meaning just the tops of the plants are growing up, and you've got some lateral side branching. You don't want this trident look to where all these branches are almost catching up with your your apical shoot. So diseases, uh, plant disease is defined by anything that prevents a plant from performing at its maximum potential. So there's two main uh, sec or, uh, groups of diseases. You have abiotic, which is non-infectious. So this would be diseases caused by external conditions, not living organisms. They can't spread plant to plant, which is a good thing. Examples of these include nutrient deficiencies, nutrient toxicity, soil compaction, light burn, wind burn, then we get into the biotic or the infectious diseases, which are diseases caused by living organisms. And they, those can spread from plant to plant. So some common biotic diseases are leaf septoria. Uh, these are caused by mainly fungi varieties um, and they can infect different hosts. So spots may vary from small discrete dots and raised areas to irregular yellow or brownish patches that cover much of the leaf surface. Foliage may begin to become necrotic and fall off if the disease becomes too severe. Similar spots can be caused by bacterial pathogens and mites. So then we get to powdery mildews. Powdery mildew is a common disease um, spores are often found to be airborne, kind of omnipresent. It's really just waiting for the, for the right conditions to come out. There's many different species of powdery mildew, and each of those species only attacks certain, certain plants. So powdery mildews generally do not require moist conditions to establish and grow, but human environments can exacerbate the issues. Poor air quality and circulation is proven to be a contributing factor. Now, the thing, thing with powdery mildew, uh, because there's different species, um, some just like to live on the surface of the plant, some like to live on the insides of the plant. So I wouldn't recommend trying to chase down what sort of species of powdery mildew that you have, but you may be able to kind of narrow it down a little bit depending on how the mildew's kind of reacting. So I, anything with powdery mildew, normal might clean it up, but I like going to Meristematic uh, to clean this issue up. Then we get into root, walk, root rot and wilt. <coughs> leaves, of the, leaves of a plants affected by rot or wilt appear drought stress or over water. They often wilt and die very rapidly. And leaves may turn a dull green, yellow, or in some cases red or purplish. So it might look like a nutrient deficiency. They typically affect young plants or clones with ill-established root systems and or poor drainage. So that's where you know, soil compaction can become a contributing factor for that. Uh, symptoms may develop first on one branch or stem and then spread to the rest of the plant. Here's some common pests we're gonna go through. We've got the famous fungus gnats. Fungus gnats are small flies that infest soil, container media, and other sources of organic decomposition. Their larvae primarily feed on fungi and other organic matter in soil, but if they got some nice healthy roots there to feed on, they'll go ahead and feed on those too. Fungus gnats can carry with them viruses and diseases, inflicting the plants when they feed on the root systems. Then we get into thrips. Thrips are tiny, slender insects with frigid wings. They feed by puncturing the epidermal layer or the external layer of the plant and start sucking out the cell contents, which results in stippling, discolored flecking, or silvering of the leaf surface. So thrips can carry viruses and diseases that infect host plants or that they, when they feed on the epidermal layer. We got aphids. 
They're small, soft-bodied insects with long, slender mouth parts that they use to pierce stems, leaves, and other tender plant parts and suck out fluids. They'll mainly be kind of start around the top of the plant. That's where cells seem to be the most supple. Uh, they don't really agitate the bottom parts of the stalks just because they get a little bit more woody as you go down the plant. It may be green, yellow, brown, red, or black, depending on the species. And aphids also carry viruses and diseases <coughs> that infect host plants when they feed. See a trend here? So white flies, they're tiny sap-sucking insects that may become abundant in vegetables and ornamental plantings, especially during the warm winter or warm weather. They excrete sticky honeydew and cause yellowing or death of leaves. White flies can carry viruses and diseases that infect host plants when they feed. This might bring some trauma on a couple of you. Spider mites, these are, these are horrible. Spider mites look like tiny moving dots. However, you can see them easily with a 10 times hand lens. If you got a really bad infestation like that, you might not need a hand lens. Spider mites live in colonies, mostly on the undersurface of the leaves to start, and then when they get daring and they got their numbers up, they'll come to the top part of the plant. They cause damage by sucking cell contents from the leaves, and spider mites can carry viruses and diseases that infect the host plants when they feed. So if you ever get an outbreak like this, and you knock them down and you can kind of get rid of them, I would recommend still sending your plants out for testing, especially if they're mother plants, just to be sure you didn't, you didn't catch anything from them. It just takes one spider mite, one aphid, one white fly to have something in its system to infect your plant. Can anybody guess the next vector? Love mites. <coughs> Jew. Improper gardening practices increase the risk of transmitting viruses and diseases to plants. You always want to wear clean, single-use gloves when working with plants in the garden. If using gloves to defoliate, make sure to change those gloves in between plants. Properly sanitize pruning tools, scalpels, scissors, shears, machetes, whatever you're using uh, with a bleach solution. If you always remember 1010, so you want a 10% bleach solution with 10 minute contact time. So I'll keep a little, a little uh, beaker like this. Uh, I'll throw a bunch of scissors inside of it and just rotate out as I'm going just to make sure that you know, I've had enough contact time on the shears. Any questions? Uh, how often do you change a bleach water solution? And like, how long does it have to break this after the seeds are replete? Um, so, so I like to change it. it it'll break down over time. Yeah, so, um, so, I mean, I, I wouldn't put a bunch of bleach and then get halfway through the garden and start rushing on pruning, just thinking it's, but, it's broken but down. It's a three days. No, I would just do single use. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, every, every time. Every time. <laughs> We're going to get into some general tissue culture workflow. So we start at stage one. This is going to be establishment in culture. Then we'll move on to stage two, which is the rapid multiplication of those nodes in culture. And then we go to stage three, which is rooting. And I wouldn't pay, this is kind of just a general overview. I wouldn't pay too much attention to the duration underneath each of these stages. Um, it can vary um, heavily dependent on a lot of factors. We'll go into that here in a minute. So then stage four, then you actually get a, seal, a saleable plant. And after you acclimate, then you can move into a larger container once you have a nice established root base. So as far as cannabis is concerned, this is the nodal workflow. You have stage one, so this is the establishment and culture. We have stage two, which is the multiplication of those uh, nodes in culture. We have stage three, which is rooting. And then stage four is acclimation and moving to a larger container. <coughs> then we get into meristematic workflow. So this is done under a microscope, not a compound. You want a stereo microscope. You start by excising the apical meristem. And once we send it through multiple rounds of uh, media transfers in our multiplication medias, 
it will then at the end there we can kind of go back and it'll almost look like uh, stage one of nodal workflow and we continue on So this is one that can kind of trip people up a little bit, um, trips me up sometimes. So totipotency, differentiation, and de-differentiation. So totipotency is the reason why we can culture plants. It's the ability of a single plant cell to grow, divide, and differentiate into an entirely new plant. <coughs> Unfortunately, humans can't do that right now, maybe in the future. De-differentiation, is the transformation of cells to a given differentiated state or cells with a job to a less differentiated state, a jobless cell. Um, so that would be like going from a leaf to what's called a callus phase. And a callus phase, which you'll see up here, those are just masses of undifferentiated cells. So they're cells without a job. So using certain chemical cues, we can then tell that callus, okay, start shooting. Okay, start rooting. And differentiation is just the organization of the cells from a de-differentiated state to form a new differentiated, to a new differentiated form of cells to carry out a new job. So we go from that callus state to shoots and then from shoots to roots. Any questions on this one? All right, we're gonna get into some standard equipment. We're gonna go over the autoclave, laminar flow hoods, pipettes, orbital shakers, magnetic stirrers, scales, stereo microscopes, incubators, and glass bead sterilizers. So your autoclave, the heart of the lab, it's one of the major pieces of equipment that really dictate a lab's throughput sterilizes items put into it at a minimum of 20 minutes at 121 Celsius and 15 PSI. Always want to prepare an autoclave with caution. You want to read your instructions and operation manual carefully and fully before autoclaving. They're all generally the same, uh, but each maker and brand will have their own um, way that they want you to prepare it safely. Excuse me, how do you properly sanitize your autoclave? Do you use isopropyl or do you use bleach? So on the inside or the outside? Both. So on the inside, every time you run a cycle, you're gonna be sterilizing. It's gonna kill anything that's inside there. Um, on the outside, I mean, yeah, you could use like an alcohol, this is stainless steel. Mm -hmm. So it'll take a lot to really, you know, put a chemical on here that'll mess it up. So yeah, I just usually just wipe it down with um, whatever I have on hand. If I got 70% ISO, I'll wipe it down with. If I got bleach, I'll wipe it down with that. The only reason why I don't like bleach is it leaves spots that sodium hypochlorite will just kind of stain it. So if you were to use bleach on this, just make sure to wipe it off with you know fresh water at the end. So autoclaving by definition is a strong heated container used for chemical reactions and other processes using high pressures and temperatures. An autoclave is used in medical and laboratory settings to sterilize lab equipment and waste like contaminated explants. Autoclave sterilization works by heat, pressure, and time to kill microorganisms such as bacteria and spores. The heat's delivered by pressurized steam, and it's used as a catalyst for certain additives in your culture media like gelling agents. So whenever we talk about autoclaving, just remember temperature, pressure, time. We use a combination of these methods, again, to kill bacteria, spores, and viruses. The temperature always around 121 Celsius. You don't want to go below that or you might not have a complete sterilization cycle. Uh, the pressure is 15 PSI. That's about minimum PSI. If you go any below that, you might not have an effective sterilization cycle. You want to autoclave for at least 15 to 20 minutes. Um, now the amount, and the amount of media and the equipment that you're putting in here and tools that you're putting in here is really going to dictate how long you're going to be sterilizing for. Um, if you put, you know, a small amount of media in here, you'll be good with that 15 to 20 minutes. When you start getting into larger um, quantities of media, you might not be putting it into this small of an autoclave, but the larger uh, autoclave, you definitely want to watch out on your sterilization time. So if you got two, three liters in here, then you want to sterilize for longer. 
if you're using that one, would you have 20 vessels, the same of those that you have right there? Would you have 20 vessels at a time, plus your medium and your sterilization items at the same time, or would you put them separate? So you'd want to do them separately. Okay. Uh, you want to put like like hiding quality of items in here, just because different different items will have different sterilization times. Um, but with this size of autoclave, you'd be pretty hard pressed to try to fit media bottles, your vessels, and any tools that you have in here. It'd be yeah. pretty cramped. Yeah. Uh, whenever you autoclave things, you want to make sure you have out of adequate uh, vent, uh, circulation inside, just so things can be sterilized properly. Okay. So, question I get a lot is, well, Greg, can I just use a pressure cooker? Uh, they're not the same. Um, Sterilizing media and sealing green beans from the garden is a lot different. Uh, autoclaves use consistent um, pressure and temperature. So you'll see on this graph field here, you rise up to the <coughs> appropriate level and it'll hold to where when you go over to the pressure cookers, you kind of get this dipping action. It's just trying to keep in a, in a certain range. So whenever you dip below optimal sterilization, you're running the risk of improper sterilization. So a couple things we autoclave, autoclave media, pipette tips when applicable, test tubes, culture vessels, uh, any sort of tools like scalpels, spoons, um, any items going into the flow hood. If the item is autoclavable, obviously you don't wanna put a microscope inside here, you will destroy it. Some of the items you can autoclave from a material standpoint is polycarbonate, uh, polypropylene, that's a pretty um, standard material that's used polypropylene copolymer, fluoropolymer containers also, those are all autoclave proof plastics. Um, if you're into mycology, you probably use a lot of like the little deli dishes. You try to throw those into an autoclave, they will melt on you. So just make sure that you check the material that um, you're putting in there to make sure that it is autoclave approved. So when it comes to autoclaving tools, uh, we put some tools in here that we got up here. Sterilization cycle completes. Take our lid off. Now what did we just do? Yeah, that we just exposed it to the air. So that's where these autoclave pouches really come in handy. They come in a lot of various sizes, large, small. I see a lot of dental offices, offices use this. What this is doing is gonna act as a protective barrier uh, to the outside. So it gives you some buffer time to take your materials from one place to another. Uh, so whenever you place anything in here, again, you want to ensure adequate seals for proper sterilizations. There is indicators on it, uh, on the packages themselves, to let you know when you ran proper sterilization. You want to ensure proper spacing, and allow pouches to dry completely to avoid leaching from the outside environment and surfaces. So obviously we're using steam to um, help disinfect these. These are made of paper, at least one part of it. So they will become wet. When you touch them, you have the possibility of leaching whatever's on your hand inside of the container or inside of the pouch. So just make sure those are dried completely before you start handling them. And you wanna handle them mo no more than three to four times um, after autoclaving. So you don't wanna pick it up put it on the table, pick it up over here, put it on the table, pick it up. So I would put it in a like uh, Sterilite container. And that way from the autoclave, you have your Sterilite container, you put it inside, close up the lid, put it on a shelf for when you actually want to pull them out and use them in the hood. A little autoclaving 101. You want to ensure that your power is on before you, or is off before you plug it in. You want to fill your autoclave to the appropriate water line. So they're made of a couple different parts. So inside the autoclave here, you'll see a heating element. That's what's causing your water to heat up. Then you have your grill plate. So to go at the bottom, that's going to keep enough distance from your well to be put inside. And inside your well, you have a little, call it a riser, 
just to make sure there's not direct contact to the bottom of your well. So once you got all your stuff put in there, ensure proper spacing. Make sure to close the lid up. That'll lock in place. And just like you were changing a tire, when you bolt these down, you want to ensure that you're kind of going in a counterclockwise motion. Not my favorite olive plate. You got any uh, mycology guys in here? Mushrooms, yeah. Right on. So some autoclaves will have a seal on the sides, or I'm sorry, on the lid, but these do not. These just have a beveled edge to it. So you want to ensure that when you're rotating these on, you keep equal space throughout, or else you could not get adequate pressure and you'll just have steam blowing out the side. So ensure the lid and the pot seals are lubricated with a thin layer of Vaseline if it doesn't have a seal. Make sure that the gaskets, if they have them, are not, are not damaged or broken, really for larger models. Ensure the items placed in the autoclave are autoclavable as we just went over. And you want to place similar contents in the autoclave with proper spacing and ensure the pouches are not overlapping with each other. Media lids are not twisted tight. Um, if you have your autoclave and some media, you don't want to crank it down. That's going to cause a different uh, atmosphere pressure on the inside of the vessel than on the outside. It may not blow up inside there, but as soon as you take it out, uh, you're, you're, you're playing with fire. So when you throw them in there, just make sure you do about a quarter turn before you throw it in. You should be good to go. So you're going to turn your autoclave on, set parameters for heating and pressure. Uh, those are really for larger models as well. Um, these just kind of have turn it on and run it. Uh, make sure the steam evacuates the autoclave for at least five minutes before closing the steam port. So this is your steam port right here. Once it hits pressure, then you're going to open this up, let that steam evacuate for about five minutes. That'll purge all the inside air out. You close it off. You're going to wait for your pressure to build up again in your optimal zone and start the timer. Uh, you're going to evacuate the steam and pressure, and pressure once the sterilization is complete. So once you're ready to go, you're going to open this back up. All the steam and pressure is going to going to release itself. And you're going to remove the lid. Uh, remove the lid once the pressure from the autoclave has reached zero. Uh, you're going to carefully remove the contents from the autoclave. They'll be extremely hot, 121 degrees to be exact. Place the media in an incubator if the media contains the gelling agent and is not to be used immediately. So a couple safety do's and don'ts I want to go over so you don't come back and sue me. Um, always read the manuals and directions carefully and completely before operating your autoclave. Do not allow the autoclave to overpressurize. This will essentially, essentially turn your autoclave into a large pipe bomb. Uh, we're sterilizing media, not trying to make a bomb here. So with some of these models, they'll have a overpressur overpressurization um, safety on it. Um, but I've seen with uh, some tabletops or um, some stovetop units that they don't have those. So I've seen some pretty gnarly videos where they blow right through the roof. Uh, you're going to want to allow the autoclave to fully depressurize <coughs> before removing the lid. Open the autoclave lid away from you and others to avoid steam burns. So when you're done sterilizing, as exciting as it might be to look inside what happened, you don't want to go like this. You'll get a steam burn. You're gonna handle the contents after autoclaving with care as they are extremely hot. And make sure to drain the autoclave of water when it's not in use. That can cause corrosion of your elements and also the um, out inside of the autoclave. So incubators, these are really cool. Uh, they're used for keeping large media, large media batches that contain solidifying agents. 
from solidifying at room temperatures, extends the working time with media containing the solidifying agents. So if you're having, um, if you've got a large batch of media, um, once they cool down to around 40 degrees Celsius, they'll start to set up on you. Um, if there's one thing worse, it's trying to clean out solidified media from a media bottle, it's not fun. So media that stays in an incubator will have an extended period of time, or media that stays in an incubator for extended periods of time may not solidify. So you don't want to make up a bunch of, a bunch of media, put it in your incubator, and then leave for Tahiti for a week. If you come back and you try to pour it out, there's gonna be too much of a pH fluctuation and it won't set up. We get the laminar flow hoods. Those, so these are going to maintain a sterile environment while pouring media and transferring explants. So any aseptic work that needs to be done, uh, this is where laminar flow hoods come in. They're one of the major pieces of equipment that dictate lab throughput. So just like your autoclave, larger autoclave, more throughput, larger laminar flow hoods, more throughput. So you always want to follow proper protocols and aseptic technique when prepping and working inside of a flow hood. There's about two main classes of flow hoods. There's vertical and horizontal. This is a horizontal. Horizontal meaning the air is coming at you. And vertical, you have a, um, your HEPA filter is actually on top. That's coming down and flowing out. So micropipettes, they're used to extract and dispense small amounts of liquid. They come in various sizes. Uh, you always want to use the smallest size possible for the amount that you're measuring as accuracy will decrease the larger of a pipette that you're using. Uh, so they range from about one, uh, or I'm sorry, 0.1 UL or microliter to 10 mLs. And always remember that one mL is equal to a thousand microliters. I brought some pipettes here today. So this is about the smallest one you'll get into. Very, very small quantities. You wanna make sure that you don't go over the intended amount or you will mess up your pipette. It won't pipette accurately. And then we got the ones here that goes all the way to 10 mils. And at the end of class, you guys can come up here and kind of mess around with those if you want. Then we get into orbital shakers. Um, these are used to apply constant, consistent agitation to a solution. Uh, these are heavily required for surface sterilization. Um, you don't want to sit there for the whole process of uh, sterilization and be shaking that bottle. Glass speed sterilizers, these are really cool. Um, they're used for disinfecting tools in the flow hood. They use glass beads in dry, high heat to kill viruses, bacteria, and other microorganisms that cause contaminations. Um, in about 1930, 1940, they replaced the alcohol burners as they do not disrupt laminar flow and are safer and are more efficient. So you don't want open flames where you're working, especially if you've got a lab coat on. Uh, your laminar flow can be disrupted as hot air is moving up, then you are disrupting that flow from actually having a nice, exactly what the word is, laminar flow is a nice smooth transition of air. So it uniformly heats the tools to proper temperature. Um, that's another problem with alcohol burners. Um, since you've got that erratic flame and also with your laminar flow hood blowing air onto it, you're kind of chasing the flame with your tool to try to get it to be properly sterile. And also with the glass bead sterilizers, you won't get that soot that you know tends to collect on tools. Exposure time is about 30 seconds at around 250 degrees Celsius. Our magnetic, magnetic stirrers here, um, they use a magnet that applies constant variable agitation to a solution. And we use those when we make culture media, just so you don't have to sit there with a spoon and keep uh, keep stirring. And there's some additives that you throw into culture media that don't like to mix well with water. So when you throw it into a vortex that's already going, makes it a little bit easier to um, bring into suspension. 
scales. I'm sure you guys have seen this before. Uh, they're used to measure weight, large and small. And they're used when weighing out culture media additives. Um, we use smaller weights when really we're working with like hormone stock solutions. You're measuring, you're measuring very, very small amounts to uh, bring into a uh, solution. So that's a jeweler scale on the bottom right. They typically weigh, weigh all out to the hundreds. From, yeah, to the hundreds. And uh, they weigh up to 20 grams. So if you're going more than that, so when you're weighing out probably like your macronutrients, um, that's what you'll be using. When you're weighing out micronutrients, then you'll probably be using a uh, the jewel scale. And again, same thing with scales as with pipettes. Um, if you're measuring out micronutrients where you don't need very uh, large amounts of them, and you want to be very accurate with it, you want to use the smallest scale that you can possibly use. Then we get into stereo microscopes. Um, not to be confused with compound microscopes. These allow for a larger field of view to be worked out to be to work at a weaker magnification. Uh, we use these when performing meristematic extractions and also embryo rescues. Uh, embryo rescues can be used with a fine eye, but uh, your glasses, then you might need to use the stereo microscope. Any questions on equipment? That's not a full list of, of equipment. Those are really just the big heavy hitters that we'll be using constantly in the lab. So these are the main factors that affect culture growth and morphology. We have temperature. You have light quantity and light quality. You have your photo periods, humidity, CO2, ethylene, oxygen. You have your macronutrients, your micronutrients, carbohydrates, amino acids, Vitamins, PGRs, um, those are not to be uh, confused with the PGRs you might see in cultivation. Uh, pH, gelling agents, culture vessels, contamination. Um, obviously, you're not trying to bring on contamination, but that is something that can affect uh, culture growth and morphology. Also, another thing that's kind of overlooked is the health of the parent plant source material and what kind of parent plant source material you're using. A little blurb on media. Culture media contains around eight parts, sometimes more, sometimes less. Uh, media formulations will heavily, it heavily dependent on genotype, phenotype, the culture stage, um, and the culture goals. So proper R&D in a lab is crucial for culture success for a wide range of cultivars. And the way that cannabis has been bred, it's almost like each uh, phenotype that you're trying to crack the code on, I'll say, um, requires its own tailored mix. So some parts of these, of media includes your macronutrients, your micronutrients, antibiotics to stave off contamination. You're using gelling agents and PGRs. Here are the differences between meristematic culture and nodal culture. So meristematic culture, um, the meristem is not connected to the vascular system of the plant. So when we talk about you know, eradicating viruses and diseases, you're not necessarily eliminating the virus or the disease from the plant. You are just isolating the part of the plant that's not inflicted with that virus or disease. What about genetic problems? Let's say you have a cultivar that is herming and you did a meristematic culture. Do you think that you could possibly stop that genetic from herming or is that impossible? So that would be, I wouldn't say it's impossible. Um, I feel like that would almost fall into callus culture. So a unique thing with callus culture is when you bring these um, cells into this undifferentiated state, what's happening is you're actually also relaxing the DNA. So when you bring those callus cells back to shooting, that DNA will compress again and different phenotype expressions can be plugged in. So you wanna make sure, you know, if you're trying to go for genetic uniformity, that you try to limit the amount of callusing um, that your uh, source plants are coming from. Callus is really that last ditch effort, you know, from like leaf organogenesis to really try to save that genetic. 
So the duration in culture for meristematic culture is anywhere between three to nine months. Um, I've had it come in less. I've had it, you know, take longer. Um, the quickest time I've been able to bring um, meristem cells to um, a large enough size to be able to root is about a month. Um, that's definitely not the status quo. Um, that was actually the, when we were going over meristematic workflow, that was that cultivar. So you must use a stereo microscope to successfully isolate the meristematic region of the plant. Um, it will yield a virus and disease-free plant with seed-like vigor. Now, nodal culture is used for mass propagation from clean mother stock. Emphasis on clean. The duration in culture is anywhere between a month and a half to three months, depending on your media formulations. Um, it's a smaller footprint compared to traditional cloning, and you have a lower possibility for virus, virus and disease and viroid remediation. Um, I'm not sure the group, small group here kind of talked about or what I was talking about um, in the beginning before class, the way that viruses and diseases operate inside the plant, they're not just riddled throughout the plant. So they can be in pockets of the plant. There's some reasons why cultures fail. Um, one of the biggest reasons is contamination. It's the number one threat to tissue cultured plants. That's why we're working in that flow hood, having that aseptic conditions. And contamination causes, that could be through contaminated work surfaces, contaminated explant surfaces, um, internal explant contamination. Um, internal explant contamination is seen a lot with soil grown plants. Um, so you've got the beneficial mycorrhizal and uh, mycorrhizae and fungi in, living inside of the plant. Um, that's great on the outside when growing in soil, not good for tissue culture. So if you are uh, culturing out plants that are grown in soil, you may have a little bit more, uh, more difficult of a time uh, with contamination. Another reason for contamination is improper aseptic technique. Um, improper sterilization, whether that's through your surface sterilization protocol or your autoclaving, or you have disruption of laminar flow. So that would really come back to contaminated work surfaces. Uh, but again, that's why we're using glass bead sterilizers. We're not using alcohol burners. Other reasons culture fail are improper media formulations. Again, as I discussed, each cultivar likes their own um, tailored mix. Uh, you get cell damage, so when you're isolating meristematic, uh, meristematic cells, very, very, um, you got to be very gentle in a way. You don't, you want to make sure you're not, you know, stabbing into those meristematic cells because you might just, might have just killed it. Uh, you get media exhaustion, um, so roots from a plant are used to diffuse nutrients and pull it towards itself when you're throwing nodes or meristematic, culture, or meristematic cells in culture, there's no way for those roots to diffuse any of those nutrients. So even though where these, where these nodes are touching, plenty of nutrients in about three, four weeks, that's not gonna be the case. Now there might be nutrients a couple centimeters to the right, but they can't diffuse those nutrients. So you want constant media um, exchanges. Uh, poor acclimation, so you can harden off the plant too quickly. Um, you have a condition called hyperhidricity. Um, that's something that's seen in tissue culture plants. Um, that can cause uh, the plant uh, stomata to not open and close properly. So when you try to bring it out into external conditions, the plant doesn't know how to act and you can get rapid cell death. Um, and also in, uh, improper environmental conditions, so too hot, too cold, too dry, too humid. So improper media formulations. Um, this is the uh, same media formulation, two completely different cultivars. So you can see really quickly how there's no one shoot fits all mix for media formulations from shoots and roots. In practice, how do you prepare for that? Do you have a more to media and materials and et cetera at the same time? Yeah, yeah. So um, that's where R&D comes in real heavy. Um, you want to make sure you have proper R&D. 
Um, you don't want to just kind of put a blindfold on and start throwing things at the dartboard hoping you'll hit it. You want to do it methodically. So uh, we teach that all in class, um, how to you know really not how to get the most out of your um, your culture media. Where, you know, if you make up a thousand liters, you don't just have one mix in that thousand liters. We teach you how to break it down um, so you can get multiple media mixes out of that. Is there like a genetic pathway, or is it just strictly data and research and trial and error dates? Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's your own data and research. Um, really, media formulations are pretty safeguarded by labs, um, but really, at the end of the day, too, um, unless you all are sharing the same plants. Um, our media formulations are going to be different from your media formulations. So for acclim acclimation, uh, this plant was just hardened off way too quickly um, and you got that rapid cell death. On the right, they were acclimated very slowly, very gradually. Um, tissue culture plants uh, inside their vessels are growing at about 100% humidity. So when you take it from 100% humidity and even put it in 60% humidity, like typical veg um, conditions, that can be too quick. So you <coughs> want to start off with from 100%, you want to hit it around 80%. Over the next few days, you can kind of bring it down, bring it down, bring it down um, until you're hitting your normal uh, growth conditions. You get hyperhidricity. Um, hyperhidricity is the new word that they're kind of coining for it. Vitrification was the old word. Um, you get these um, kind of like claw-like uh, growth um, from the uh, from the leaves. Uh, you get improper, very improper morphology. Um, they might almost look glassy and always look like they'll stay wet. Um, this is very large in part due to ethylene buildup. So ethylene is actually a hormone, it's a gaseous hormone. And if you get too much ethylene buildup, then this kind of stuff can happen. So one of the, it's, it's not entirely understood what can cause hyperdricity um, to a factual level, but adding vented containers or adding vented lids to your containers is really a good way to fight that along with some other uh, tips and tricks. Let me get into the number one threat, which is contamination. Um, they can get pretty wild looking. So uh, there's a bunch of different kinds of contaminations. Uh, there's about five, six, six different kinds of contaminations that can occur. It can be bacterial, um, it can be uh, yeast, it can be viral. So kind of a common rule um, that we look for is if you initiate into culture, and here's the node, there's contamination happening over here. That's telling us something that our media, media sterilization wasn't properly uh, performed. Now, if it's coming from, look on the far right here, that contamination actually started from where the plant was put into culture, and it worked its way out. So that might tell us, hey, there might be something inside of this plant that's causing that. Is there, there was an, I don't think we talked about like, is there a way to sterilize, do you sterilize the plant material before you put it in? Yep, yeah. well? yep, so you do um, surface sterilization uh, yeah. protocols. There's a bunch of different protocols for that. Um, we found one that's kind of stuck. Uh, we've had great success with it. Um, so, if you guys want to learn more, uh, we do hold classes in Sterling Heights. Um, it's a five day class. Uh, it's really hard to fit all the information that we teach in class in a very small amount of time that we have here today. Uh, we do facility consultations, so if you're a larger facility, we can come do some on-site uh, on training for you guys. Um, all, all labs are not the same, so some labs want to eliminate their mother rooms and do nodal culture. Some labs want to have, or some places want to have a lab just for virus and disease remediation, if that's what they want to do. Uh, we do have online classes coming soon. Uh, we're in the works probably in the next month or so. We'll have those rolled out. So if you follow us on Instagram, make sure to, or if you don't follow us on Instagram, make sure to follow us because uh, we'll be releasing it there. If you want to come and attend a class, we use Lido 823 for 10% off class. Take about 250 bucks off for you. Um, there's our website, Instagram, Facebook. 
Uh, if you do want to come in and take a class, there's a few things that you'll learn. So you'll receive um, our class binder full of tips, tricks, um, the protocols that we've uh, formulated over the past years. Um, you get hands-on experience in a tissue culture lab. Uh, with the online class uh, rolling out, we're also going to have a private Facebook group. It's going to be full of useful resource, resources, uh, studies. We're going to have community support. Uh, so you'll get community support from our team and also other group members. Um, you get all proper equipment required for a tissue culture lab and how to properly operate them. You'll get all proper protocols to follow when working in a lab and when working with plant material. You'll get a full understanding of what media is and how to make it. How to properly sterilize explants to be initiated into culture. When, how, and why uh, to add supplements into media. Uh, information on how to screen plants for viruses, viroids, diseases, and for performance. We'll go over leaf organogenesis. Um, how to perform embryo rescue to save old or improperly stored seeds. Uh, and also go over, uh, and you'll have an understanding of optimal environmental conditions for cultured plants and how to troubleshoot issues that arise in culture. That's it, we got a little Q&A, any yeah. questions? Um, so I'll say the strain, I find like the right media for a specific strain, now will that strain always use that specific media or do you think like it could potentially, I might have to try other medias for that strain? So in our experience, once you find the media, you found it's the, the media. media. Okay. Yep. And the only thing that might, um, cause you issues is through multiple subcultures. Um, the, the plants that you're initiating in the culture already have uh, their own media or their own uh, nutrients flowing through them, their own hormones flowing through them. So if you're in an unoptimized media, or I'm sorry, what looks like an optimized media at first, uh, later down the line through multiple subcultures, mm -hmm. uh, you may find that uh, the, the plant's kind of given out and exhausting itself. Uh, so that really just hinted to you that, hey, maybe we didn't find the exact media formulation we were looking for. Okay. So, so if you do find it, it should work all the way through. Yeah, yeah. So okay. ju just as much um, like ex outside of culture, um, you see any issues. Um, so if your plants start yellowing out, it's probably going to be nitrogen, you know, per se, lack of better without getting real into the nitty gritty of it. And in culture, it's the same way. Uh, you start seeing yellowing out, then hey, you might need more nitrogen supplement supplement in the media. Uh, if you start to see a bunch of like weird morphology happening, that's probably hinting more towards um, a hormone disorder. So then you can add like or get different hormones maybe, and then try to bring that back that yep. way. Yeah, okay. you want to. Uh, so we have like a like an R and D panel that we give you in class, mm -hmm. and it lets you methodically run through certain media formulations and combinations, uh, so you can find the quickest. And some labs are selling like that pre, like a pre-mixed media type of deal. Is how do you feel about those? Do you, do you would you suggest making your own media with hormones yeah. versus buying a pre-mixed already hormones? Yeah, okay. yeah because you know um, that media. If, if you have that media and you, and you throw a, a cultivar in there and you start to see issues with that pre-mixed media, there's no way for you to tweak it. Okay. Yeah. So, so can you can you tweak it while? <laughs> Wow, it's in vitro. Like, can you can you adjust the, the media when, as you see the plants need, or do you just really make the adjustments in the future? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if if you got uh, your cultivar, you're saying, oh, we need more potassium. You would make up a media batch with potassium. You throw it in there, um, and within three four weeks, you know, it's a lot of it's just kind of watching to see so what you it's going to do. So you throw it in the actual with one that you're already working, or with another with another something. What they exchange? Yeah, them. yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Batch. Yep. A lot of, a lot of, a lot yeah, of succession. How do you yeah. feel about synthetic seeds? How do I feel about them? Yeah. Um, Heard a lot of not, it's not worth it. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's not a protocol out yet. We're trying to formulate our own <coughs> protocol. We're having some pretty good success, but before we actually roll it out, we want to make sure that, hey, we have a protocol <coughs> that works on a wide variety. Uh, but just like culture media, synthetic seeds like their own, their own tailored mix. <laughs> So, you know, down the line for, um, you know, cold storage or even cryopreservation, that's going to be really, really neat. Um, but again, I, I don't think the industry is ready for it. Um, the last thing you want to do is have a prized cultivar encapsulated in synthetic seeds, and now you've lost it. Yeah. You can't bring it back out. Any more questions? Um, I Or no? 
Um, it, it might not show it in the vessel, but if you know you have you know a positive um, test from that, then you might just be multiplying six plants. Okay. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about uh, activated carbon in the media? I've heard it's a lot of like old school people that used to do it, but it's not really worth it either. Um, we've used it. That's actually what those those <coughs> yeah, have so supplemented it. Yeah. 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 Um, we love it. Um, it likes to absorb, or it helps to absorb um, any. Um, like natural PGRs that might be existing in the plant, um, so it does a, it does a good job of, I'll say, trapping anything that you might not want the plant to be absorbing. Gotcha. Wouldn't it be trapped in the humidity itself, though? Um, nope. So it kind of it, it it'll hold on to it, and it won't spit it back out. Gotcha. For lack of a better yeah, yeah. explanation. So you just rinse the media off and put it into the dirt when you're done with your tissue culture? Yep, you want to just rinse the gel off to, under some water? Yep, when you go to acclimating, okay. um, that's what you'll do. You want to ensure that um, all the media, as much media as you can, is washed off. Um, this media, um, plants like growing in it, but also everything else does too. Yeah. So, so once you expose it to that air, you're starting, sure. to, get, yeah. you're starting <laughs> to get a lot of problems that can kind of attach to it. How do roots get oxygen? How do they get oxygen out of the media? Yeah, like do they eat it? Um, <laughs> yes and no. Um, really what you're doing is with the constant uh, media change outs, um, you're allowing that to take place. Um, yeah, it, it's, we haven't really ran into an issue where um, like the roots or something start kind of doing like that vanilla browning yeah. um, off just because of lack of oxygen. Uh, once you do those constant media transfers, then you're good to go. Have, 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 have you ever come across where you already have nodes growing and you have roots and everything and it starts perfect and then all of a sudden it has like a, I would say, pink color bacteria through the roots? Do yep. you, do you do like a wash up and still use that or you would, just, would you just discard it? Um, Personally, I would discard it, okay. um, but there's a difference between, so are you seeing it just at the tips of the roots? Yes. So that's actually, um, that's not contamination. Um, that's, I might butcher this, but it's it's anisin. Um, it's, it's something the plants naturally do uh, okay. to kind of protect itself. Um, so unless you start seeing that <coughs> kind, of, kind of going throughout, spreading throughout the culture media. No, on, uh, only around the tips of the roots. Yeah, you're good to go then. Okay. How long do you, do you have to do the media exchanges? Uh, about every three to four weeks. Um, every two weeks might be beneficial, but what we found is about every three to four weeks. You bring it out under the hood and you make the exchange there? Yep. Uh, yep. Do you root into the agar or into plugs? Because I was taught with uh, plugs, actually. You can do both. Okay. Yeah, there's, um, I will say if you root in vitro, you're going to have a... You know, lower mortality than if you were to just go from, you know, no callus at all, just to no right into a plug. Yeah. yeah. So, do you do you have to keep on changing the media, or could you, if you have a very good medium that it's hormone free and it has been working and it's spraying the roots, do you would you continue to change it, or would you just leave it? So once those roots start start kicking out, um, I just leave it. Okay. Um, TC roots are very fragile. Yeah. Um, and once Really, the whole point of doing the media exchanges, or a, a large uh, reason for the media exchanges, is just to uh, replenish that node if it's not rooting with all of the all the nutrients that it needs. So once you start having roots flowing out into your media, then now it's able to diffuse and pull nutrients when from you, the rest of the media. When you do have roots and you're gonna transfer, you could transfer anywhere. Right? Like I right now, when I transfer from the medium, I put it into the Conex and I do a very low EC formula for it. And then I have them growing there in a perfect like sterile environment. And then from there, I veg them for a couple of months, take clones from there and pass them to the Kona or the mother room. Um, do you prefer any other medium or would you like arrow? Oh. Um, so I, I like Coco, I'm a Coco guy. Um, Rockwool, really good too. Um, 
you know, when you, the only, the only reason why I get a little, little leery about putting, um, putting it right to soil is just because of um, all the other stuff that's living in soil. Um, so if you have any sort of agar that's still on your plant, then you might kind of run into some issues. And is there a, um, a more efficient way to kind of just clean those, the medium off? Because usually what I do, I kind of like try to scrape it off as, pos as, as gentle as possible. Mm -hmm. And then I have my either my distilled water in my magnetic stir, and I kind of like let it kind of like fall off. And I, I do, it, sometimes it kind of, it's right in there. You don't want to kind of like press on it because you don't want to break the roots. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? Um, Really, I mean, you, you're kind of on point with it. Um, really, whatever whatever way that you can find that works for you, where you're not breaking roots off, um, uh, you can sit there with a it's, straw and try just, to blow, it's blow just the like agar off. Having more patience with it, basically. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Whatever way you can get that agar off, you're good to go. When you make that transplant, is it important that everything off, or will the roots continue to grow through the media? Yeah, you want to make sure all of, all of your media is off. Uh, before you go to acclimation. We have a question back here. Oh, it was already answered, but even during media transfers, do you, do you drastically clean the, uh, the node before you transfer it to another? No, no, I, I, if we're not seeing any sort of issues, um, if you start to see things growing on your node, um, you may be able to do like a, a resurface sterilization of it to try to kind of save it. Um, Can you run over a small example of a service sterilization process with us? Um, so there's there's a lot of different methods. Um, some some places use sodium hypochlorite. Some people use um, uh, ethanol. Um, some places use uh, just straight up surfactant and multiple DI washes with sterilized water. So really, whatever service sterilization protocol you're using, if you're not getting contamination, it's not broke, don't fix it. And that's giving it a bath. It's putting it in a jar with some liquid, whether it's soapy or bleachy, rinsing it off. Yep. Okay. Yep. And, and really, it's like sterile DI washes that you want to do. Do you have a preferred number of notes that you like to put in a vessel, especially if you're using those? I mean, when, when we're going for initiation, about four. Four. In, in, those, in those vessels. Um, obviously, in a test tube, we wouldn't put four nodes in a test tube, but it all just depends. But once you start rooting, do you put it in its own? Like if from the shooting, say so you have shooting and rooting, and then you're gonna go, when you root it, you wanna put it in its own. You don't wanna have three or four yes. rooting in yeah. one. Right. Yeah, okay. the, yeah the, I just wanted to make yeah, sure. Yeah, the, mo the most frustrating thing is probably having a bunch of roots kind of tangled together, um, and then you're trying to Separate. You know, make sure that you're not breaking anything off. Okay. What happens if you don't get all the agar off when you're transplanting it into it? So you get like funk going on. Um, you get stuff that attaches to your agar. So yeah, just not not a good practice. You just want to make sure you get all that agar off. Any other questions? I mean, if you're trying to get rid of uh, a virus versus trying to get rid of thrips, is there a totally different washing process? Yeah. So thrips. So anything external. Um, so thrips, fungus mats. Aphids, anything like that, you can eliminate with a surface sterilization protocol. Some pests are a little bit more stubborn than others, so you really want to make sure that if it's just a pest that you're trying to eliminate, that you know you keep a real keen eye on what you're looking for. So just because you run um, a surface sterilization protocol does not mean um, you kill the pest entirely. So just make sure you keep keep a keen eye if you need to do another surface sterilization. After that, then that's what that's what's needed. But um, yeah, a virus that's going to be meristematic culture. Any other questions? Cool. Thanks for coming, guys. Thanks to Leo and Roberto. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.